Good morning. So I've got a few different groups of friends that raise cattle, and in the summers they, they just kick them out. And it's funny, they'll tell you that when the evenings get cooler, the minute the nights start getting cold, you don't have to go find them, you don't have to go chase them down, you just, you just wait. And when the nights start getting cold, they just start making their way back in. And we were completely full in the first service, and now looking, we're even a little more full starting for this service. And I'm like, wait a minute, maybe that's not just a cow thing, because the nights have been cooler. I'm like, maybe it's just part of living in Oregon. The nights start cooling off, and everybody just starts kind of coming back together. And then I realized, like, whoa, wait a minute, I just called everybody cows in the first service. I better not do that again. And then here we go again. We, uh, the last time I preached, and I got I to gotta clarify this. I gotta, we got we to gotta understand this before we can jump right into the, ser- the, the sermon. Here's my favorite thing to do my, uh, as, a, as a speaker is to find verses that don't land exactly right. You ever read something in the Bible and it just caused kind of one of those like reactions? That's where we're going to go today. But before we can get there, we've got to review the fact that we have looked at the the pattern of sin. Was anybody here a couple weeks ago? The pattern of sin is that it will groom, you know, be nice and be kind and create some some sort of camaraderie. But then right on the heels of that, there's a demand. Maybe you've had bosses like this. Maybe people have been in marriages like this. Maybe you've had friendships like this where it starts with like, hey, best friend. And then, you know... I've done something for you, what I'd like for you to do for me, so that's the demands. And then if the demands aren't met, then it comes in with threats. And if the threats aren't met, then harm and then death. And, and there's a whole sermon about it if you want to go back and look. But that when you watch sin, that's the pattern of sin and that's the pattern of the enemy. And it's easy to see that that's not just people being people. That is people operating in sin. Grooming, demands, threats, harm and death. And if we're not careful, what happens is... I I think there have been times in my life where I have assigned that exact same pattern to God. Where God will, he'll love you, but then there's there's rules, there's demands, and if those demands aren't met, then things are going to get hard, and things will get harsh, and then things in life will get bad, and then ultimately, if you don't obey God, he throws you into hell. There's no possible way. There's no possible way that the God of the universe that is the creation of love, is the source of every good thing, could possibly follow the exact same pattern as sin. It just couldn't possibly be the case. That that couldn't possibly be true of God. And that the, the truth of God is that God is, is pursuing, and he's pursuing, and he's loving, and he's calling, and he's redeeming, and he's calling us back. And even in moments of failure, even in moments where we disobey, he's still pursuing. That the operating system of sin is grooming, demands, threats, harm, death. But that God is pursuit, and pursuit, and pursuit, and pursuit, and pursuit, and It leaves the door open to the misconception that maybe then, okay, then are there rules? Are there requirements? Are there standards? Are there things that that, that have to be met? So this is kind of the, the, maybe the continuation or the completion of the first sermon. But if you weren't here, I just, we got to review that one part of it so this makes sense. Now, remember, God of love, not a God of punishment. God doesn't ask you to obey so that God feels more important. God asks you to obey because God loves you and wants what's best for you. He's literally giving you an indicator of how to make life go better and that we turn that in our sin and we go, well, that's what you want, but what about what I want? So have you ever read, have you ever read a verse that just lands sideways? I'm gonna read it to you. Matthew chapter 18, this is Jesus. Matthew chapter 18, verse eight. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, some of you guys are going, oh no, it's that verse. (laughs) Cut it off and throw it away. We're not reading this to make you feel better. If it's landing sideways, if this is causing an eyebrow to go up, that's the intent as it was written. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. I started writing this sermon three weeks ago, and then a week and a half ago, I had a little thing happen with my own eye. And I was like, oh, man, I don't have to rearrange sermons. I can't preach that, that with one eye. That's going to send up all sorts of red flags and false Like, totally unrelated. This is just, I'm an idiot. This. If this verse bothers you, If Jesus saying you'd be better to cut off your hand and gouge out your eye causes you to go, I don't like that verse, just hear me on this. 
That's the intent of the verse. That's why it's there. It's not there to encourage anybody to cut off a hand. It's not telling you to gouge out an eye. We're going to walk through it. We're, going to, we're only going to cover one point A to point B this morning. That's it, the whole sermon. We're going to look at it in detail. Point A is that that verse lands and causes people to go, what? But point B is that I believe this. It is one of the best descriptions of God's love if you know what you're looking for. You can read this verse, and if you unpack it, if you dissect it well enough, what you're going to find is that Jesus is explaining beautifully the love that God's got for us. And the reason he says it this way is because it doesn't just pass by. You don't just read that verse and have people go, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> Chop off your hand, cut off your foot, gouge out your eye. You hear that when you go, excuse me, what? And that's what it's designed to do. And if you look at it deep enough, you're going to find what's actually there. Okay, so a couple years ago, I went to Alaska. I went fishing. I went salmon fishing. The silvers were running. Uh, we, we landed in Anchorage. We spent all night, landed in Anchorage, got on a float plane, flew another couple hours on a float plane, landed in a river. It's beautiful. Land in a river, get off on the, the, the side there, get in a boat, and we go 45 more minutes in a boat to the Talashalitna River. There's no grid. You're completely off grid. It's where the Talashalitna and the Squintna meet. So it's the mouth of the Tal River. And it's, have you ever seen on TV where two different colored waters touch, but they don't mix? That's this. And we're salmon fishing, and I'm so excited because I don't know if you know this or not, salmon are huge, and they're delicious, and they're hard to reel in, and like there's some investment. By the time we stepped off the boat, we had already spent almost a day getting there. There's investment, there's associated value, and I am pumped. And we went up there at a time where the guys that were working there, they had the week off, it was a friend deal, and so we were just kinda hanging out. They weren't there to work, they were there to hang out, we were there with them, and so they're gearing up, and I'm like, you guys are going fishing? They're like, yeah, we're going trout fishing. And I'm like, do you mean salmon? They're like, well, no. I'm like, why would, I'm all excited because salmon are huge and they're exciting. And they're like, no, we're going trout fishing. This is actually the best trout fishing destination, they said, in the world. I'm like, what, what do they taste like? And they're like, oh, no, 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 it's catch and release. <laughs> and I'm like, did I hit my head? Did I just, how long have I been up? I'm here, okay, have fun. You guys go trout fishing. I'm going salmon fishing. Let me show you a picture. Let me show you a picture of the first fish that I'm talking about. When I say salmon fishing, how cool is that? That's not even the biggest one. It was just the best picture. I'm just kidding. So I go fishing. They go fishing. They come back, and that night, we're sitting there in the cabin. You can take that off. It's going to be distracting because it's such an awesome picture. Um, <laughs> but we're sitting in the cabin that night, and they get to talking and it's insane, but they started to make sense. They said, what you got to understand is that the salmon, they're like tourists. They're just here for a little while, and they're here to die. They're just coming upstream. They're not biting anything because they're hungry. They're not doing this in an effort to survive. They've accepted the fact that they're dead. This is, they're, they're biting at stuff out of frustration. They're here to spawn and die. They're only here for a little while, but the trout... They're here year round. They're here all year and they're hard to catch and they aren't the tourists. They're tough enough to stay all winter. They're tough enough to stick it out. They survive here. They're not hatchery fish. They're here year round and they have to paint their own little bait beads so that it looks exactly right and they're difficult to catch and there's an art to it. And they go, salmon, they're just dumb. They're just grabbing it, whatever. And I'm like, wasn't that easy. But what they're explaining, if you follow me here, what they're explaining is a passion. They are passionate about something that I wasn't passionate about. But true to form, when someone is that passionate about anything, it has this effect. It draws you in. And they said when you catch a trout up here, they're not expecting to die. They're making every effort to live. And they're like us. They stay here all year. And it begin to kind of register with me that, wait a minute, there's a connection there that they have with these fish all year. The reason they're not excited about salmon is they look at salmon the same way they look at us. You're just here for a minute, and you're gonna be gone. We're here all the time. So the next day, 
because I was just absolutely curious. I went trout fishing and it was crazy because here's, I was asking like, so are they huge? Not really. I mean, they're, they're good. Are they easy to catch? No, they're the opposite of that. And I'm like, that would seem like the opposite of what I would want. Little, difficult to catch. I want big and easy to catch. <laughs> I'm going fish, and here's what's crazy. I actually did hook. You know 97% of the time that you're getting a bite, you don't even know that you're getting a bite because those fish are smart. And I was fishing, and the guy was like, you're getting a bite. And I'm like, <laughs> huh? How do you, what do you, he's like, now. And I'm like, you're standing 30 feet away and you're seeing something that I can't even feel. That's intriguing. So I caught one and I didn't just catch one. When I caught one, he took off and he was, I mean, it was a good fish, but he took off and this thing was jumping. It took me 15 minutes to land this thing and all of a sudden I understood what they were talking about. There was something about it that was different. You're not reeling in this big half dead log. It's a fish that's fighting and he's excited and he's beautiful and he's fat and he's thriving in a difficult condition. There was something kind of cool about it. I'm not, I got another picture and it's way less exciting, but <laughs> look how little that stupid little thing is. You couldn't have explained it to me in words. If you were to show me the two pictures, I would go like, okay, no, go back to the other picture. <laughs> you can take it down. Here's, what, here's why this story came to mind, is that I was reading something that David wrote, and David is describing with passion something that has brought me frustration in the past. Something that in my life I have viewed with frustration, David is describing with such passion that it causes me to go, what? where does this passion come from? How could someone be this passionate about something that's this difficult? Let me read it to you. I got way ahead of my notes. Psalms chapter 119, 97, it says, Oh, how I love your law. I'm going to finish this, but let me tell you, the law in church is not a fun word. In fact, how many times do you know people who, they don't want to come to church strictly because of the laws? It's restrictive. It's not fun. How could anybody enjoy the law? And it's the law that's kind of the, uh, it's the thing you got to overlook, or it's the thing that's frustrating. And David is saying the exact opposite. He's saying, I love it. Not only do I love it, listen, he goes on, he says, I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. There's a lot in there. I would encourage you, Psalms 119, 97 goes through, but... David is indicating that he has found something that maybe we overlook. As the masses keep moving, King David has found something. And let me tell you the background on King David that was so interesting. There is an argument, and this isn't in the Bible, so I'm not saying that this is absolutely true, but there is at least a theory that when Samuel came and said, there's the king in your house, bring in all your sons, David's own father didn't include him. He brought in all the other sons. He says, it's got to be one of these. And Samuel says, not one of these. And then, and then and only then, they went back out and got David. And they said, well, I guess it could be David. David was someone who had been overlooked in his life. David was someone who had been underestimated in his life. David had spent time being shoved to the outer edges and forgotten about, not having a purpose, not being valued. And there's the argument that David could have possibly been illegitimate. It's not there, but if it's true or if it's not true, it doesn't change the fact that David was given early in life a unique perspective. He said, go to your brothers and bring them food and bring them supplies. His dad said, go to your heroic brothers. And when he got to the battlefield, what he found is that God was preparing him to be a hero and not the brothers. So when David listens to the law, he's listening and going, it was you that brought me out of obscurity. It was you that gave me a purpose. It was you that called me by name. It was you that gave me a name when I was a nobody. It was you that called me to be the king when my own father didn't even consider there was a possibility. Tell me more. 
And as he's writing about the law, what's interesting is that you see a love and you see a passion that is hard to ignore. And what's so interesting about that is the masses look at the law as restrictive. That it's the law that restricts, it's the law that keeps us from it. I want to paint a picture if I can this morning. If I can paint a picture, I'm going to ask you to participate. And I know it's elementary, but it really does kind of help make the point. If we're standing in an intersection, left, let's call taking a left, that would be to go to sin. Take a right, that would be to go towards God. Now, you can't see the ends of these roads, but the word says that at the end of this road is death, regardless of the fun or the difficulty, that taking a left and the end of that road would be death, and at the end of this road would be love and life, and that's who God is. But you're standing in an intersection at a time in your life, because you will at some point if you're not right now, where both roads actually look almost identical. The road towards God and the road towards sin don't look that much different most times. So as you stand at this intersection, what you have been asked to do by God is to take God's word for it. I don't know about you. I'm terrible at that. You ever have people just take my word for it? I can't. <laughs> the word says that if you follow that road to completion, it leads to death. If you follow this road to completion, it leads to life. So Deuteronomy says it this way. Today I give you a choice, two ways. I ask heaven and earth to be witnesses of your choice. You can, bring, you can choose life or death. The first choice will bring a blessing. The other choice will bring a curse. So choose life. Then you and your children will live. Here's the important detail that we have to get. I used to think that God used to punish me out of frustration. That God used to punish me out of disobedience. I had people in my life that would punish me when I would disobey. And I thought that when God says, if you choose to disobey, I'm going to bring curses on you. And that I will reward you for getting it right. That was my understanding. But that is not what it's saying. It's saying there is a road that by itself brings curses. There is a way to live life that makes things more difficult. And there is a road that by itself, even though it can be difficult, brings life. There is a giant difference than a God who just punishes you because you didn't do what he says. And a God who warns you don't go that way, it will be difficult. An accurate God concept makes these kind of verses come to light first date Lacey and I ever went on, we're going to go super spiritual here for a second, Nacho Libre. <laughs> and there's a, there's a part in this stupid movie that stands out because it accurately described my theology. How sad is that? But he's becoming a wrestler, and, and it's with the luchadors, and they wear the mask, and it's this big, exciting, glamorous life. And he's working in a convent, and he's wearing his robe, you know, and he's sneaking out. And so in this scene, <laughs> I wrote it down because I want to get the words right. But the kids are wrestling, and he's trying to explain to them that they can't wrestle, but you see it in his face. He can't explain why bad is bad. He just knows that bad is bad. You ever been there? Or I've just told you're not supposed to do that but I don't know why. He says, I know the wrestling seems fun, but you can't do it because it's in the Bible not to wrestle your neighbor. It's not. And you see these kids trying to work it out because here he sits in this robe with a little rope tied around as his, as his belt, and he's trying to tell them that the life that they've seen, these big, glamorous, fancy life, like it may look fun, but, but don't. And my life, you know, it may not look very fun, but it is. And it's super unbelievable. He says this. He says, I know that the wrestlers get all the fancy ladies in clothes. I'm trying to do this with a straight face. Just bear with me. <laughs> all the fancy ladies in clothes and creams and lotions, but my life is good, really good. You guys remember this scene? He says, I wake up every morning at 5 a.m. and <laughs> get to make soup. It's the best. And these kids are like, I love it. I get to lay in a bed all by myself all my life. It's fantastic. I know that's cheesy, but... It makes a point. It makes a point. As you're standing at this intersection and you're trying to decide, the problem is, is that a majority of people say, I want so badly to sin because it looks like more fun and I can't risk pursuing God because what if it costs me everything? So what I'll do instead is I don't want to suffer the consequences of sin, so I'll just sit still. I'll just do nothing. I'll look at sin. I'm like, man, that looks like fun, but don't worry, I won't do it. As though sitting still is an option, pause. Let's take that same Thought. Let's take that same concept, pause, 
Let's apply that exact same logic to a different relationship and see how much sense it makes. Husbands, try this. Come home this week and tell your wife, honey, good news. I'm in a good mood. I'm in a generous mood. I feel like I'm going to be a good husband this week. So this is what I promise you. I will not cheat all week. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> We're laughing. We're laughing because you're like, I would never say that. Honey, this week, all week long, no abuse of any kind. No emotional abuse, no verbal abuse, certainly no physical abuse. You're welcome. What you're saying, as ridiculous as that sounds, what you're saying is, don't worry, I won't take a left. But that's it. I want credit for being a good husband based on what I refuse to do, but we will not take a right and take an active approach into being a husband. And when you look at it from a marriage, you're like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But how often do people go, I'm just trying not to sin, just trying to follow the laws. The laws tell me I can't do this, then the rules tell me I can't do that. We just try to hunker down and, well, we're saved and we're going to heaven, so we're just going to try to not mess it up between now and then. <laughs> it makes actually less sense in living for God than it even does in a marriage. Standing still is not the purpose of the law. What David is saying is this. David is saying, I stood at the same intersection between left and right, and I believed God. I took God's word for it. I took a right and I went headlong into my pursuit of God. Now stay with me for a second because that sounds good on paper, but it's terrifying. It is terrifying when you say, I'm all in, God, you got all of me. I'm pursuing you, tell me what you want. But what David is saying is after I've made the decision to pursue, your law comes to life. The rules, we've got to understand that God has not given us anything that is bad for us. God has not given you anything that is bad for you. If you've experienced anything harmful, God's able to use it for your benefit. We'll get to the rest of the correction in a minute. But what David is saying is, in light of who you are, listen, God has invested more into your good than you have. So this idea that somehow you need protected from God doesn't even logically make sense. You either believe that there's a God that's a good, loving God who sent his son so that you could experience salvation, or you don't. But you can't believe that somehow God was willing to do all that, but now he's just punitive and self-interested. A God who's self-interested doesn't send his son on your behalf. The, the, the logic breaks down. You with me? What David is saying is that I've gone headlong and your, the law is guiding me in my pursuit. As I push forward, it's your law that keeps me on the road. It's useful. It's helpful. I depend on it. And this, because I love you, I love the law that you've given me. I love you. And because I love you, I love your law. See, so many times the problem is this. We don't love the law because we don't actually love God. And we don't actually love God because we don't actually know God. And so law becomes restrictive. And what David is saying is this. I've said it before, but I'm going to use it again because it's a tremendous analogy. You have to restrict, you've heard it, you have to restrict a fish to the water for the fish to experience freedom. And what David is saying is I have found freedom in my restrictions. I have found that your law opens doors for me. I have found that your rules take life and make it better. I have found that when you restrict me to my purpose, life becomes better and I love it. And the more I realize that the freedom comes through the restriction, the more I realize that everything that you've done has been for my benefit. That's a, that's a jump that a lot of people struggle to make. I didn't understand this, and here's why. Because I constantly took a left. <laughs> I struggled with correction. I struggled to accept correction, and here's why. Because remember, if you go back to grooming, demands, threat, harm, and death, if you view God as having that, as you view God as sitting back going, and if you don't, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Every time I, 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 I experienced correction, I felt accusation. Please stick with me here. When I would experience correction, I felt accusation. Why? Because that's how people correct. 
People will say, you're always this way. You've always done this way. This is who you are. You're such a failure. You're such a screw up. This was intentional. We can't just correct. Sin comes in and adds accusation onto it. And because we hate accusation, we avoid correction. Can I say that again? Because we hate accusation, we avoid correction. We lump accusation and correction in together because we don't understand that correction is one of the most valuable things that we could experience. Correction is valuable and it's useful and it's administered in love by a loving God free of accusation. That when God corrects, he corrects us free from the accusation. Let me show you what that looks like. There was a rodeo clown when I was a kid. He comes out and he's got a list. The announcer goes, what's that? And he goes, it's a list of all the people I can beat up. He goes, you can beat up all those people? He said, yep, absolutely. So he starts reading the list. And the rodeo announcer goes, wait, 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 wait. That's my name. I said, well, yeah, I can, I can beat you up. He said, you can't beat me up. He said, yes, I can. He said, no, you can't. He said, yes, I can. He said, trust me, you cannot beat me up. And he said, trust me, yes, I can. And the announcer said, listen, I have... Fought, I've been in classes, I've been trained, I know how to fight. I promise you cannot beat me up. Clown says, okay, I'll just take that name off. <laughs> as silly as that is, that to me is the best example of correction without accusation. The announcer, stupid as a clown, I'm sorry. The announcer is saying, that's not true. And the clown says, oh, okay. That when, as a good father, we take a left and we begin to start down a road that is going to bring us harm and pain and difficulty and if left alone leads to death, God sees to it that he intervenes and that he engages. He clicks the activate button. He says, I will do what I can to make sure that you experience a little amount of pain, a little amount of discomfort so that you don't have to experience destruction. I love you enough that I will do what I can. I will do what I'm able so that you will choose in a moment of correction to experience repentance. You know what repentance means? It's not that you grovel, oh, you're so good, I'm so bad, I'm terrible. That's just fraught with accusation. That's just full of just accusation and and gross. Repentance is when you're going this way and God says, turn around. And you go, oh, okay, I'll just go ahead and turn around and go back this way. That that's what God's looking for, that that's what God's asking for, that that's what God's encouraging. And that we come in, we make it this big dramatic ordeal, and God's going, it doesn't have to be a big dramatic ordeal. I'm just asking that you operate in the freedom of restriction. It's one of two things. We're either deeply thinking about this, or this is a super holy group of people that are like, we know. (laughs) It's so quiet. But I believe, I believe that God is saying repentance brings us back into the freedom of restriction. And we say, well, what if we don't want to? God says, well, I'm going to continue to engage. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Anybody raising kids around horses? There is an ever-present destruction that as parents we're aware of. It is a parent's worst fear that a child experiences something that is beyond our control. That they experience a pain that we can't fix. That they experience a destruction that we can't solve. And so because that is the ultimate that we're trying to avoid, what happens is we instill discipline and we enact correction. If I say stop and you don't stop, I'm going to allow you to experience a spanking. Hear me on this. It's a sample It's a sample serving. It's a sample size that says, I don't like this discomfort. And I go, if you think this is bad, wait till you experience pain that's not from me. Wait till you experience damage that I didn't give you in love. Wait until there's something actually damaging that takes place. And the hope is this, is that a child in their heart will say, I don't like the small amount of discomfort that I'm experiencing. And in love without accusation, I'm going to repent and I'm going to begin to obey because I believe in the goodness of my parents. The world has messed this up so badly 
that somehow we've connected that God wants what for us and that if we can get away with it, that it's okay. And, and all of a sudden, the whole idea of correction or accusation has just got muddled. It is so much more simple than we've made it. He says that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. If I raise people who are unlikable, I have to own that. Part of my responsibility is to raise young people who become likable adults. Why? Because it produces a harvest of peace for them. And then when God engages us, he says, I love you. And the correction and the discipline cannot be absent in a loving relationship. In a loving relationship between you and God, it cannot be absent of correction. Because in an absence of correction, you go headlong into destruction. So, back to the beginning where Jesus says, cut off your hand and gouge out your eye. <laughs> Let me clarify. He's not saying gouge out your eye or cut off your hand. What he's saying is this. He is saying, as you start in a direction that is harmful, that ultimately down the road leads in death. Ultimately results in death. Ultimately is the destruction that we are all trying to avoid. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. But as I go, I'm going to do the best I can to put roadblocks. I'm going to do the best I can to allow you to experience sample servings of discomfort. I'm going to allow you to experience an, an example of what will happen if you continue with the hope that you'll turn around. And that anything shy of the ultimate destruction can be administered in love with the hope of bringing you back from death. You guys follow me? So what Jesus is saying is nothing that you experience this side of death is done to you in anger or punishment. Everything that God allows you to experience, everything that God... Now listen, you're going to have pain unrelated to your actions. That's just part of life. I'm saying specifically in moments of disobedience, God has a miraculous way of making sure that you know what it's about. He's got a miraculous way of communicating to you going... This is what I was warning you against. This is what I was trying to bring you back from. And what God is saying in that verse is nothing this side of death could possibly be damaging if it causes you to come back. It's a word picture that says even the most horrific things, this side of death is still better than what you'll experience in a moment, in a moment where God pulls back his correction. Any sports people out there? They say that, don't be mad at a coach who's coaching. Be concerned when your coach stops coaching. What that statement is saying is when God finally pulls up and says, okay, okay, have it your way. That is the most damaging thing God could do. And God's warning you, I will allow you what you ask for, but I will continue to do what I'm able to do, hoping to bring you back. And what David is saying is, oh, I've already come back. I love the law that allows me to continue moving forward. Here's what's interesting. You go to Deuteronomy 30. I want to read it, the end of it again. It says, then you and your children will live. Choose life. Choose life so that you and your children will live. Here's what's interesting to me. I love this, I love this, this, this thing here is that King David eventually became the king. He came out of the sheep fields. He killed Goliath. He overcame Saul and all the things that he went through, and he became the king. And his kids watched this, and he was the king. He was unchallenged. He didn't write what he wrote because he had to. He was the king. He could have wrote anything he wanted to. And he says, I love God's law. I love it. I love reading the word. I love knowing what God has to say for me because I love God, and I know that God loves me. And what he gives to me is for my own benefit, and I can't get enough of it. And what he would do is he would talk about it, he would write about it. And don't you know Know that his kids got to see it. Your kids will get to see it. Your kids will have a legacy, good or bad, based on the, the road that you painted. Based on the road that you've paved for them, it'll make your children's easy, lives easier or more difficult. So David writes this. He says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We shouldn't lean. This is, <laughs> we're not leaning against the law. We're not trying to rebel. David is saying, I love the law. I'm leaning into it. And the more I lean into God, the more he leans into me. And the more I realize that I am above my circumstances. When circumstances are good or when circumstances are bad, I'm learning that God is a God of love. And somewhere in the kingdom, Solomon 
was listening. He was listening because don't you know there were moments where Solomon goes, Dad, what about money? King David was like, oh man, that's salmon. That comes and goes. That's stuff for tourists. That's stuff that's just, it's temporary. Money, money comes and goes. It's fine, but it comes and goes. Okay, Dad, okay, Dad, what about power? Well, it's big. It's easy to catch. But that's salmon. That's just seasonal. That comes and goes. That's not permanent. That's not here all the time. You go, how do you know this? Because after David, Solomon becomes a king and God comes to Solomon. It matters to me. I've got kids. I've got kids. And if you've had kids, you know that one of your biggest concerns is, am I messing them up? God comes to Solomon. He says, you're the king now. What do you want? Tell me what you want. Tell me anything that you want. You tell me anything that you want, and I'll give it to you. Any one thing. And Solomon says this. He says, I can't, I can't go all the way with temporary things. I can't go where I need to go with money or power or influence. I can't go as far as I need to go. I need something that's real. I need something that's permanent. I need something that's from you. And in a moment of trust for God, he said this, give me wisdom. I think the reason that 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 lands with me the way that it does is because I think about my kids and actually I think about your kids. I think about what Tab's doing back there. What she's doing is she's saying, yeah, the salmon are great, but if, if you go trout fishing, they're here all the time. They are us because the laws reveal who we are and that God loves us. And then when you lean into who God is, you come to life and everything gets better. The salmon come and go. The wealth comes and goes. The power, it comes and goes. The law, the law comes to life. And in a moment where pressure is applied and, and Solomon is granted access to either way, he says, give me wisdom. And God says, well, if you want wisdom, let me tell you, everything else comes with it. Isn't that what King David says? says, delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Didn't Solomon experience the promise that was given to him by his father? Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It was the love of the law that David had that birthed that into his son. Now, was his son perfect? No. No, but the promises are evident. Proverbs 3, 6, Solomon writes this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Solomon is saying, don't, don't get distracted by the temporary. That's just for tourists. That's not for us. You honor God in your life, you go headlong into his life that he's got for you, and he'll make your paths straight. I love the law because it's the law that brings me to life. The law, the function of the law, listen, it says the function of the law is not what saves us. God is what saves us. And as we go pursuing God, the law becomes useful. Now, this is it, and I'm done. Hey, I think I'm four minutes early. You are all welcome. It just means I get to pray for a long time. I think for too long the world has been turned off by the law because we have described it like Nacho Libre. <laughs> it's so good. It's super good. Oh, man, so awesome. Like marriage, you get to just sleep with one person forever. It's great. You have to give 10% of everything. I love it. And the world goes, I'm okay. When you start to unpack everything that God is and everything God has said and the passion that you have for it comes to life, watch and see, watch and see if people don't go, tell me more about that. How? How do you love something that I hate? How do you lean into something that I lean away from? And you become useful 
And you become the person laying a paved road for the next guy. You become the one leaving a legacy for your children, and you get to reap a harvest of peace. Let's pray. Lord, take us from point A to point B today. We're a verse that lands sideways and kind of makes everybody uncomfortable. The, the, the reason for it is to say that you've gone with us into correction. You correct without accusation. Lord, anything that you do, this side of ultimate destruction is done in love for us. But God, if we could get past that, what we would find is that your love for us is calling us to better than we have for ourselves. Lord, if we could become passionate about what you have for us, we become useful for the next guy who doesn't understand, who has, has leaned out, who doesn't understand who you are. God, if we could understand who you were, your word makes more sense. Your word comes to life, and as your word comes to life, we come to life. We become contributors instead of consumers. Heads bowed and eyes closed just for a second. I'm not going to have anybody come to the front. We're not going to embarrass anybody. Hey, if you need to get baptized, get baptized. I'm just saying specifically for right now. If you would say, that's me. I've tried to obey just enough of the laws that I can sit still. I've been the, I've been the one stuck at the intersection, unwilling to go right and not wanting to get caught going left. And this morning you would say, I need more passion for the law. <laughs> I need more passion for who's God, who God is. I need a better view of who God is. Because if I can get a better view of who God is, I'll better understand his word. Can I challenge you this morning with this? If you're here and you would say, I need to see it clearer. I need more love for the words that God has given me. Can I pray for you this morning? Would you raise your hand? Let me just be praying for you this week. Man, all over, all over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Lord, you see the hands. Move us, God. Move us out of a period where we describe the law as restrictive. God, you see the hands that were raised. Move us from that. Take us where we are and move us into a passion that says, I follow the law because I want to. I follow his words because there's life in it. I follow it because I know that there's a loving God at the end of this road calling me home. And the best my life will ever be is in moments of following God and pursuing God and passionately obeying the words that he's given me. God, move us out of a season that says we, we, we do it because we don't want to get caught into a season that says, give me more. I want to know more. I want to go deeper. I want to see times in my life where I've experienced correction without accusation, where God is genuinely just asking me to turn around. That's it. Just turn around. He's not trying to accuse me and call me bad. He's saying, I'm calling you back. I'm calling you to better. I'm saying there's a better way than the way you're doing it. I am purposefully making things difficult. I am allowing small amounts of pain to avoid larger ones later. God, that we can accept correction without accusation. And follow the law with the passion that says that you're a good God. You can put your hands back down. But Lord, help explain it to us in a way that only you can. Paint it in a way that only you can so that we can take this and put it to use in our lives. You have a love that stands up. You have a love that corrects. You have a love that brings stability. Help us to see it as that. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.